anything I do to improve my physical performance is going to improve my longevity. Do we need a study for that? No. So we have a study now that one study says you need to improve your quadriceps strength. One study says you need to improve your calf strength. One study says you need to improve your grip strength. One study says you need to do cardio. All of these correlated things, these things that are supposed to improve all these different aspects of our life. How do I stack all of those things together? It's like impossible. How do we take all this information and what do we do with it? When we see all of these correlation studies, we see all this science out there, be aware. If it's correlation, but they're labeling it as causation, that's when you need to be aware. Hey there, I wanted to let you know about my latest book, Body Confident, that's coming out in September 2024. Call it a critical thinking guide to your health journey because it is a framework, a guide, a blueprint that's going to help you understand and be able to filter all the information that's out there on the internet that you're getting from social media, YouTube, go to bodyconfidentbook.com, sign up for updates. The book comes out in September. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Coach Bronson here, and we are going to talk about one of the reasons why I think you shouldn't pay attention to the science too much. It's setting you off in the wrong direction. You're getting confused, and it's making your journey a little bit harder than it needs to be. Before we get into why you should avoid science, uh, I want to make sure that I remind you to subscribe to the channel, click on the bell so that every time I drop a new video, you're reminded. And please do me a favor and share my channel with anybody you think might be interested in getting information that could help them improve their quality of life, physical freedom, and personal independence. Science is really tricky right now. There's a lot of science being thrown around, and I'm saying science somewhat facetiously in, in the terms of information that is being put out into the community by people who have a background in science, their PhDs, their doctorates, their MDs, their researchers, and everybody's making a name for themselves and they're building brands around their niche of scientific in information or focus. People that are specialists in hormone therapy, people that are specialists in menopause or leptin resistance or epigenetics or endocrine system, uh, all of the different things. There's so many different things out there right now where people are trying to find a niche in a market of health and fitness that sets them apart from other people. And they have to validate the information that they're trying to sell by pushing as much science as possible. Here's the problem with that. Most of the scientific information that is getting pushed is correlation, is this information is being put out there because we've seen people that have this characteristic or have done this thing have this is the result of that happening when that's not necessarily the case in most of the situations here's an example it's a most really common example it's one of the examples that is used most often to get people to be afraid of red meat red meat causes heart disease we did a story we did a study we've done studies where thousands of people hundreds of people evaluate what they're eating on a regular basis for a year, six months, 10 years, 12 years, whatever it is. And we've determined that those people that have the highest consumption of red meat also have the highest percentage of cardiovascular disease. That's great. It's information. It's useful. It's something that triggers us to say, maybe this is something we should look into. And that is one of the functions of scientific research and studies, digging into what's going on and how do I, we identify what things we need to understand better. We should not be taking action in our individual lives with our individual context and the things that we are specifically trying to do to improve our quality of life based on correlated data. It's helpful to maybe say, hey, this is something I should look at. Is this impacting my life in the way that they're saying it does? It's not, I'm not saying don't ask that question. It's part of the evaluation process of any information that we get. How does this impact my context? The challenge is most correlated information is interpreted incorrectly, isn't established at a baseline that makes sense. Okay. The meat thing for heart disease is a, is a, is a great example. We're looking at all these people, they eating, they're eating meat. We're classifying it as red meat, but what is it really? It's processed meat 
that comes with French fries, bun, seed oils, a shake. Like we're looking at the meal that a person is eating, not just the meat consumption. It's not saying I just want someone to eat steak for six months and then I'm going to look at their markers and see where they are. Are they at a higher risk or lower risk of heart disease? No, we're looking at complete intake. They may have one meal a day, two meals a day that has some meat in it. And that entire meal is being classified as meat, right? They ate more meat than someone who didn't, who only had maybe one meal and then two salads for the day. I don't know what it is, right? The definition of how we're defining these things, then correlating the results is completely, completely um, lacking all causative evidence. There's nothing that shows specifically what is happening, why it's happening. That's the key, why it's happening and how that is impacting the result. So in an effort to build market share, have sensational headlines to grab eyeballs on content, a lot of this stuff doesn't mean anything and we shouldn't be looking at it. What, what should we be looking at? We should be looking at what are the things that I'm seeing actually work in people's lives, okay? Now, how is that any different? Correlation versus anecdotal, basically the same thing, right? Here's the difference. You can look at an individual. You can find out what they're doing over a period of time. You can get into communities. You can look at the things and try some stuff for yourself and see how these things are working. If I actually take meat and just eat meat, what happens? Do the blood work, play, play around with it yourself. So again, correlation in the science that's out, that's out there isn't necessarily bad. It's part of the process, but I don't know if we should be making decisions based solely on that. I think combination of using correlation to say, let me look into this more. Let me experiment on myself and equals one. Let me see, does this make sense in the big picture? That's another piece here. Some things come out that are correlation studies that you go, well, duh, of course, right? Here's an example. Longevity is correlated with increased quadriceps strength. It's also correlated with calf strength, grip strength, a lower resting heart rate, an improved VO2 max. Sprinting more often is correlated with a, with a higher level of longevity. If you get eight to 10,000 steps a day, it's correlated with increased leg. All of these things are correlated with living longer. That's fantastic. Does that surprise anybody? If I'm doing things to improve my physical performance and the ability of my body to process energy and to make things that are physically challenging easier, if I'm stronger, if I have a better cardiovascular system, I might live longer. Do we need a study to tell us that? Why is that information impactful other than maybe validating something that we all, that makes sense already on the flip side of correlation studies that are telling us to avoid certain things or that certain things shouldn't work the way that they are working. We know from personal experience for myself, clients that I've worked with for years that red meat does not cause cardiovascular disease. Red meat is a primary factor in healing and improving cardiovascular disease and metabolic dysfunction. Okay. We know that it's evidenced in real life. I can see that regardless of what any correlation study says. On the flip side of that, we know that anything I do to improve my physical performance is going to improve my longevity. I'm going to probably live a little bit longer and I'm a better quality of life while I am living. Okay. Do we need a study for that? No. So we have a study now with that one study says you need to improve your quadriceps strength. One study says you need to improve your calf strength. One study says you need to improve your grip strength. One study says you need to do, um, uh, cardio in zone two on a regular basis in order to improve your longevity. One says you need to sprint on a regular basis to improve your longevity. What do I do? How do I get all of those things in? How do I focus on quadricep calf and grip strength, reducing my resting heart rate, increasing my VO2 max, sprinting more often, and making sure I get eight to 10,000 steps a day? Oh, and by the way, um, I can improve my brown fat and increase my metabolic rate by doing cold showers or, or cold baths every day. I can improve recovery and 
a whole bunch of other things by taking peptides. I can start taking supplementation for hormones, hormone function, like all of these correlated things, these things that are supposed to improve all these different aspects of our life. How do I stack all of those things together? It's like impossible. What are the, so what do we do? How do we take all this information and what do we do with it? I, need, I, had, I had a client ask me one time when the grip studies, when the, the grip thing came out a couple of years ago and everybody's like, oh, grip strength is correlated with living longer. Literally going out and just buying a grip thing and they're like, I'm going to improve my grip. Okay. The rest of their body is falling apart and they're so focused on just getting their grip strength better that they're missing the fact that it's not the grip strength that matters. It's what are you doing in your body that's causing your grip strength to improve? If you go lift weights and you start squatting and doing carry heavy carries and you start working your upper body and you start moving weight around, your grip strength is going to improve. But it's not the grip strength that makes the difference. It's all the stuff you did that impacted your grip strength. Okay. So when we see all of these correlation studies, we see all this science out there. Be, be aware. The stuff that is coming out from a scientific perspective telling you what to avoid is often something that you should dig into more to find out what are they actually saying? Can they actually make the claims that they're making? If it's correlation and they just say it's correlated, we don't really know what it means, something to take a look at, do further research, great. It's informational, use it or don't. Okay, cool. If it's correlation, but they're labeling it as causation, that's when you need to be aware. That's when you need to say, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. Just because you see these two things connected doesn't mean either of them had anything to do with each other, right? Just because every time I go out, the sun is out and there's no clouds and I don't have a headache doesn't mean that every time there's clouds, I'm going to have a headache, right? That's the kind of logic that we're, we're applying here. Be aware of that. On the flip side of it, just because a study is coming out or scientists or something is coming out that says you need to do something to improve X, Y, or Z aspect of your health, also take that with a grain of salt. Can you do that thing by maintaining consistency with the basics probably, or do I need to focus on that one specific thing? Every specific little thing that you focus on is adding to you the complexity and the challenges you have to face to try to fit it into your routine. Do I need to worry about doing extra stuff just to make my quadriceps stronger? Or did I continue just doing the weight training that I'm doing? My quads are going to get stronger. All of the, my muscles in my body are going to get stronger. I'm also going to improve my cardiovascular performance. I'm going to improve my VO2 max and my, my resting heart rate. I'm going to increase my mitochondrial density and my ability to process fuel. Like all of these other things happen, even though I'm not focusing on just my grip strength or just my quadriceps strength or just my resting heart rate. Don't get caught up in all those little things, guys. What, is the, what are the big things, the basic things that you can do that don't necessarily need a study to tell you it's important to do. Do you need, ask yourself this question, do I need a science scientist to come tell me, think about this, do I need someone in the scientific community to tell me that eating whole foods, mostly meat, lifting weights regularly, and getting good sleep will help me improve all the aspects of my health and metabolism. If I don't need that, if you don't need that, which I'm telling you right now, you probably don't, then what's stopping you from doing the basic little things consistently to move forward every day? Something to think about. Don't get stuck in the, in the minutia. Don't get stuck on the mechanisms and the protocols. Think about what are the big things I can do every day that require little changes to implement, but they have the biggest impact on my life. Take it easy, guys. See you next time. All right, guys, you know I am a fan of protein. You know that prioritizing protein is a key aspect to the fundamental concepts of nutrition. I highly recommend for those people who need the help in increasing their protein intake, Equip Foods Beef Isolate Protein Powder. They have a ton of different flavors, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, salted caramel, coffee flavor. It is the cleanest and most effective protein powder that I have ever used.